Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce the moderator, Dr. Patrick Cloning, Chair of Asia Pacific Security and Senior Fellow at the Harrison Institute. We have four distinguished panelists, Dr. de Montbrial from French Institute of International Relations, Dr. Fyodorov from All Russian Center for Public Opinion Research, Dr. Suzuki from Hokkaido University, Mr. Yokohama from NTT. This session will be in English. Thank you. Now, I would like to ask Dr. Cloning to start the session. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here at this fantastic event organized by JIA on their 60th anniversary. And I want to convey the best wishes as well from Hudson Institute President and CEO Kenneth Weinstein who is looking forward and hopes very much to spend far more time in Japan in the very near future. He's a staunch defender of U.S.-Japan relations, global dialogue, and world order. And that brings us to the topic of this panel, which is looking at digitalizing societies and international order. Our information age is creating unheard of knowledge sharing but harnessing the benefits while minimizing the risks is a balancing act for both states and international order. And we're gonna hear four different perspectives on these issues about the challenges to individual societies like Russia, but also the big picture of how cyber technology, digital technology is affecting international society and international relations. Um, and we'll hear as well from private sector view, not just thoughts about how governments are acting. We are focused on two basic questions. At the end of the day, we are trying to understand better how digitalizing society is affecting state authority and order. How, how Japan, how France, how Russia, how the United States, how other countries are being affected by this digital age. And then putting all these states together and in their international relations together, the larger focus is on how do we maintain, preserve, adapt order? How do we build rules of the road? How do we deal with concepts like sovereignty? These concepts between the state and international order are interrelated. They're really harder to disentangle than I, I would suggest, but let me, by way of preamble, just highlight a few of my own views from my own American perspective about the importance of stability in cyberspace because it's important for the United States, it's important for all of our states, and yet it's clearly critical for international order. And so at the level of the state, three challenges that I would just throw out and highlight, and there may be a little bit of repetition, but don't worry, there are some very interesting views that are coming here with our distinguished panel. Um, I think the first point I'd make is how the perpetrators of cyber crime and malicious attacks are largely going um, unpunished. And the costs of their actions are rising, and they're rising rather rapidly. And you can find lots of indicators, although it's tough to find one number that encapsulates the total cost. But just the, the one little fact of, of cryptocurrency theft and scams got my attention this last week, thinking about the first nine months of 2019, an estimated 4.4 billion US dollars in theft in cryptocurrency, and that compares to 1.7 billion of all the last year as an estimate. Now these are just estimates, but the point is, the scale just grew more than three times in one year, maybe four times, uh, and that's just one facet of the criminality that's occurring in cyberspace. And I don't want to start with the problems, but I do focus on a lot of problems because ultimately we're looking for new ideas and new solutions. A second problem at the state level is the dissemination of fake news and disinformation. It's proliferating. It's everywhere. We literally don't know what is true and what is not true. That's a problem for society, for states, for democracies in particular. And we can't really keep pace with the viralization of malicious information. Bad news travels so quickly. Um, and how do you put that right? 
how do you correct the record once that's out there? It's devastating. And some of the solutions we see around the world in autocratic states are not the solutions that democracies want. We're not looking for a surveillance state solution. The third challenge for states is that the cyberspace problem within a state is seldom confined to the state itself. So it instantly becomes an international issue, almost by definition. So how we organize to deal with that is a problem. Even before you get to the private sector and how you fit private sector in with governments to, to deal with it, and then figure out international institutions to figure out uh, what they're doing. So the 2017 Not Pietia exploit was originally aimed at Ukraine, but wound up disrupting global supply chains that cost some $10 billion to put right, according to Nigel Inkster. I think in terms of international order, and Chairman de Montreal is going to be offering some great big think thoughts on these issues. But in my smaller view, we have two big challenges. One, one challenge is to recognize how all of the economic benefits and uses uh, and incentives driving high technology in the information space that are mostly good and that we're dependent on for future economic growth have countervailing security implications and they're intertwined. And so you think about how a state like China can have an industrial policy made in China 2025 label where they're investing in all of these emerging technologies, largely information centric. And that's a good thing for economic growth, but it has profound security implications because big data will fuel advances in AI and quantum computing and this fuels the technology rivalry that has geostrategic stakes. I've just written a paper on the development of cislunar space. The space between Earth and the moon is literally going to be rapidly developed in the next decade. We are not prepared for this rapid development, but it is the ultimate high ground in cyberspace. It could neutralize everything from ICBMs, which, have, which means strategic stability changes and deterrence concepts change, um, to uh, making a surveillance planet rather than a surveillance state. It has huge implications. What's happening under sea, you can't see. It's even harder to talk about. Where all those cyber cables are um, sort of laid, and yet there's a lot of development and focus on capabilities there that have a lot of implications for security, and yet they're economically intertwined. Um, I think th the flip side of this challenge is the challenge of norms and rules of the road. I'll just end with this sort of point. That for all these problems that we see, there is a great deal of effort that's been accumulating over the last decade and the last three or four years in particular to try to create rules of the road and cyber norms. So the United Nations Group of Governmental Experts reached a consensus at least that international law and the concept of state sovereignty apply to cyberspace. Similarly, in just last month, the Global Commission for the Stability of Cyberspace issued their final report with recommended norms, including controversial norms like whether the state alone should have the ability to hack back, to have offensive cyber. That, that makes sense to somebody who deals with government policy, but is it realistic? Can that be enforced easily? Uh, how will that be enforced? Um, I think Prime Minister Abe has taken a leading role. Um, we've seen even on the margins of the G20 summit in Osaka, his push for the free flow of data with trust. But it has a long way to go, just as the ASEAN Regional Cooperation Framework, which has been trying to minimize harmful effects of fake news, is only dealing with really minor issues so far, like improving digital literacy and fact checking. So these are some of the challenges that I see for the state and international order. Now I'm really delighted to turn to four distinguished panelists, beginning with Dr. Mambriol of IFRI, who, and who has, um, you know, we've asked to maybe just provide his initial checklist of big questions about what are these challenges from cyberspace for international relations? Thank you, Patrick. Uh, I think that when you consider such a
difficult problem as the cyber uh, world facing us. Uh, one has to be very modest, and this is why what I'm going to do is really to give a list of a, a few uh, issues. You, 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 you did actually more or less the same exercise uh, without uh, pretending uh, to bring uh, any uh, solution uh, at, the, at this stage. Well, first, uh, what is the concept of cyber power? Uh, this is a, a, a difficult uh, concept. What is a cyber power? Clearly, everybody would uh, recognize the United States and, uh, uh, and, and China and uh, Russia as uh, cyber powers. But uh, in fact, you also have much smaller countries which are cyber powers. I think in, in Europe, the UK is a cyber power. To, to some extent, France is less so, but it is also a cyber uh, power. But uh, Israel is a cyber power, perhaps uh, as much as Russia. Uh, and, uh, and Estonia is a cyber power to some extent. So uh, the, the concept of cyber power is something that has to be deepened. And uh, the uh, uh, one uh, aspect uh, of uh, what a cyber power should be is to have offensive cyber capability, offensive. And even a country like Estonia has offensive cyber capabilities. So uh, that's, I think, an important concept very different from the uh, concept of nuclear power, for instance, for a country to be, for a state to be a full uh, nuclear power. It's not enough to have one bomb that might explode. You have to have a full-fledged industry. Uh, you have to have uh, vectors, missiles, airplanes, uh, etc., etc. In the case of cyber power, it's much more diffuse. So that's the first question I wanted to, 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 to raise. Uh, second, a very general issue, which is that with the cyber world, everything is vulnerable. And uh, the, we are speculating, for instance, on uh, car autonomy. And uh, you can, everyone can read that maybe as early as in uh, five, six, or seven years from now, uh, we will have uh, autonomous uh, cars driving everywhere. Well, uh, frankly speaking, I am a little uh, doubtful uh, about it because it seems so easy uh, to uh, attack uh, a, a network. And if uh, somewhere you, know, you have a big uh, incident, that can block the whole system because by its very nature, it is complex. And complexity, one aspect of complexity is the impossibility to describe the system fully. And, uh, uh, the analogy with the brain and the neural system is a little bit premature uh, when we talk about these things. But more generally, this issue of vulnerability is extremely important. For instance, it is possible that sometime in the next uh, five to ten years, we wake up in the morning uh, learning that 100 planes has crashed simultaneously because uh, of a cyber attack. Okay, so we are back to the issue of cyber attack. But clearly, if, some, if something like that happens, it would be globally a shock, uh, at least of the size of Fukushima. That is, it, it is something that would change the, wor the whole glo world approach to, to, to the issue of developing uh, autonomous uh, networks and the like. So uh, the, uh, uh, just an, an, an in, a major incident, because after all, 100 uh, planes crashing, uh, that could make uh, perhaps 20,000 casualties, which is uh, much less than a nuclear bomb. Uh, nevertheless, in terms of political impact, you can easily imagine what it would have as a consequence. And this will happen. 
this will happen. I don't know when and how, but this will happen. Now, uh, uh, still on this issue of uh, cyber uh, uh, attacks, etc., we uh, must be aware that uh, there is already one cyber war going on right now. And we all know what it is. It is China against Taiwan. This exists now. You know, this is a, a real cyber war. What is uh, the end? What is the end of this cyber war going to be? Uh, nobody knows yet uh, e exactly. Now, another aspect of the issue is the demultiplication, the demultiplication of, e of emotions. Now, emotions, the phenomenon of emotions is not totally new in the world. I give you one example after World War I. That's a true uh, example. So uh, imagine we are in 1919, 1919, in the French parliament, some uh, members of parliament uh, pressed the government to act uh, in favor of the Paul Doven people in uh, somewhere in Central uh, Europe who was uh, uh, still uh, uh, living under a bloody dictatorship and uh, the members of MPs uh, asked the government to act to in, in favor of the Poldovian people. And there was a motion signed by about 80% of the MPs uh, to support, uh, to support uh, this uh, initiative. The trouble was that the Poldovian people did not exist. So you had a, a true story, you know, the majority of members of parliaments uh, uh, signed petition to support a people which did not exist. Uh, 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 you, you don't smile, but you should. <laughs> uh, no. uh, uh, you did, because <laughs> he did, because, because, because he's Russian, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, emotions can sometimes happen uh, for... Uh, 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 out of nothing, uh, 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 they can build, be built entirely. But now with the cyber world, we are talking a totally different world. No? We can uh, create emotions out of nothing hmm? because uh, if I say that uh, somewhere in Xinjiang uh, a few people uh, have been uh, ill-treated uh, or thousands or tens of thousands of people have been ill-treated, well, yeah, in my case, I happen to know where Xinjiang is. And most people in this room know where Xinjiang is. But y you can imagine that uh, the public opinion in general uh, d does not have the slightest idea of where most uh, uh, countries uh, are, cities are. And they can uh, all of a sudden inflame, <laughs> inflame by, by, uh, by news, uh, real news or fake news. So uh, propagation of uh, emotion and uh, also uh, something I alluded to yesterday, which is the b changing of behavior of uh, uh, politicians, heads of uh, government, even statesmen, who today uh, use uh, as a normal way of behaving insults, insults, you know, to, to, to talk about their counterparts uh, abroad. You know, insulting, in the past, you would go to war. At least you would break diplomatic relations uh, if, a st if, if a head of state insults a, an, another one. Well, this today, unfortunately, seems to be becoming a normal uh, way of, of behavior. And of course, I relate that to my remark on emotions uh, more uh, generally. Now, uh, I move to another subject, which is uh, the uh, multiplication, the demultiplication of propaganda. Now, when we speak of interference, for instance, uh, in the elections uh, of, uh, of others, uh, the, uh, and of course, if the Russians uh, have tried to influence the last presidential election in the U.S. in favor of Trump, it is not the smartest uh, move they, they, they have done. I am sorry to say, inc inc including for themselves, the, the trouble my, 
my dear neighbor, is uh, that uh, when you do such a thing, you, you, you have to be very smart in predicting the consequences. That's, that, that, that's the issue. But, but seriously speaking, uh, uh, everybody uh, interferes with everybody else. No, no, nobody will, will, will convince me that the United States is not doing the same uh, 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 almost everywhere and so forth and so on. So it is, uh, and this is, very, this is very old, because, but, but what is new again is the size, the dimension uh, of the phenomenon uh, uh, thanks uh, to, to technology. And, uh, and this we do not know exactly, it's impossible to predict where it will go. You know, classical propaganda we knew. The so the fifth column, uh, as it was called, something very classical. Today, uh, we, it's very difficult to, to know really what we are talking about in terms of consequences. If uh, this leads me, you, you mentioned, Patrick, fake news. But there is something worse than fake news, and much worse than fake news. This is deep fake news. And deep fake news is something that is now feasible. Uh, that is, uh, you can uh, take any of us here, and you can uh, build, or, uh, you, you build for, from uh, almost nothing uh, a speech uh, the, uh, the, uh, from, from that person, that look totally uh, exact, you know, that it's, uh, uh, and you can, uh, you can make it so, so that the person say anything, including uh, uh, going back insulting uh, the neighbors. Maybe Mr. Trump himself is a deep fake uh, individual. Uh, I, 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 I don't know, I have never thought for the first time, I asked myself the question, but the trouble with deep fake news is that the technology, to my knowledge, the technology is such that it is almost impossible to prove that it is fake. And uh, if you can uh, uh, build, you know, uh, fake uh, events, uh, a, a fake session of events uh, on this uh, on a conference, and if it is Im impossible uh, to 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 dismantle to, to prove uh, th that it is uh, fake, it, it, it raises a number of totally unprecedented uh, uh, problems. And to, uh, to, to one last example, I think we could find many others, is this issue which is very much discussed these days about face rec facial uh, recognition, uh, which of course can be very useful in a number of circumstances, for instance, for fighting uh, terrorism and so forth and so on. But uh, uh, when you look about the discussions in about China, for instance, you see that uh, the, the, the there is one other aspect of the issue that is the possibility to build up an Orwellian state. And, and this uh, too is something uh, that was for uh, novels uh, in uh, the recent past, so it's, uh, it's one more example. Again, I think this is not a, does not pretend to be a, a, a complete list, uh, but let me conclude uh, in the following way. You know, if we, if, we, if we think about the future, which is what we are doing in, the, in this conference, uh, facing complex problems and increasingly complex problems makes uh, forecasting uh, more and more difficult because the, uh, I, I, as a former mathematician, I uh, can be precise on this. You know, the, the, the root, uh, the nature of complexity, complexity, in its very nature, makes uh, f forecasting uh, impossible in certain circumstances, even in deterministic phenomena, uh, which is the paradox. You know, you can have, in principle, absence, no, uh, uh, no uncertainty, uh, no fundamental uncertainty. For instance, when you have networks which are connected well, nothing is uncertain, everything is determin deterministic a priori.
but the result, the way the whole thing functions is nevertheless unpredictable and can go in various uh, 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 dimensions. And this is why, uh, for, for instance, even when you say a very simple thing li li like uh, 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 a, dicta a dictatorship will, in the end, will collapse. Uh, no authoritarian government can survive forever. But when you say that, you say nothing because you are unable, and for deep reasons, to say the date when it will happen. You can say that an empire will collapse, but it is impossible to predict exactly when the empire will collapse. The reason being that the short-term reasons for the collapse are of a different nature than it, it's the, 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 the long-term. Uh, uh, aspects like like an earthquake, you know the the, the 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 fundamental causes of an earthquake is the tectonic plates, but the short term a short term reason for a particular earthquake is a totally different phenomenon, which is the re sudden release of a certain quantity of energy. So uh, that's my last one. Sorry, I, I'm afraid I have been a bit too long. But my last sentence will be to say that we are, the world is more and more complex, more and more unpredictable, which is one more reason to be more and more, to try to be more and more careful in, in, in whatever uh, we, 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 we are doing, you know, to, to be a able to reduce the probability of uh, catastrophes. Well, an excellent beginning to some of the big questions. And now we're going to shift to the other question about how digitalization is affecting one society, one state. And to take the Russian case is fascinating because given Russian history, I mean, what a rich history this country has before the digitalization of the world. So it's for Dr. Fedorov to explain, well, exactly what is the impact of digitalization on Russia? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the process of digitalization is uh, very difficult and complex, and uh, its consequences are different for different uh, countries. Let us speak about Russia and Russia specifics. Uh, digital digitalizations, uh, as you know, in the modern world uh, had speeded up time, reduced distance, and uh, expanded the scale. Those social and uh, government institutions which uh, were able to function at the dawn of the digital era, managed, managed to take its advantage and sharply strengthen their influence. On the contrary, non-viable institutions were severely struck again as a result of de digi digitalization. Uh, let's take Russia as an example. Today, the Russian tax service is one of the world leader in tax collection digitalization, as you know. This is one of the reasons why the Russian economic crisis and uh, stagnation were characterized not by a decline, but rather a considerable increase in state revenues. It was the expense of improvements in the administration system possible due to digitalization. On the other hand, the Russian tax service was an extremely powerful institution even before digitalization. However, Russia's anti-monopoly service was and remained to be a weak agency which has little influence despite process of digitalization. As far as other agencies are concerned, digitalization has grant, greatly enhanced the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness uh, of the Russian army, police, and security services. But those agencies have always been strong in Russia. Uh, unlike, uh, for example, the party system, which was and remained to be rather weak, and digital digitalization did not play a great role there. Another example is a uh, higher education system. In Russia, digitalization in education has led to a gap between a dozen and a half leading universities and all other universities. The gap was in place long before, but now it has sharply deepened. 
banning the professors of the weak universities from delivering lectures and replacing them with online lectures deliver delivered by professors of the living universities are widely discussed, discussed today in Moscow. More and more well-trained school graduates prefer to enter strong universities, while the weak graduates have to enter the weak ones. As time goes by, strong professors leave the weakened universities, weakening universities in favor of the stronger ones. It is getting more and more difficult for the province's universities to perform as point of increase for the local communities in Russia. Uh, the third sphere is economy and banking system. Banking has seen a dramatic de decrease in the number of banks last year. Uh, and at the same time, there has been concentration of capital uh, in several largest financial institutions. The crucial factors of success here are government support and successful digitalization. Sberbank, the leader of our banking market, managed to overcome the digital divide in a timely manner. Uh, as uh, its CEO called, the elephant has learned to dance. Only a few fastest growing private banks are able to compete with an institution like this one. Uh, and the fourth example uh, about urbanization, the city of Moscow has taken a huge step towards digitalization over the recent decade, having become the only truly world city in Russia. As a result, the traditional gap in living standards and quality of life between the capital and the Russian provinces has rapidly increased. The government is making efforts to reduce this gap, but without great success. The Moscow example pushes the provinces towards development. Many cities try to become smart or innovative, but the advantages and opportunities of living in a digitalized Moscow area are obvious. This city acts as a center of attraction for businessmen, skilled workers, and young people who move from the provinces, uh, leaving them without any future. Thus, with digitalization, with digitalization, the strong are getting stronger and the weak are getting weaker. Digitalization is likely to increase gaps and differences rather than leveling them out. It intensifies the contradictions of capitalism. The world and particular countries drift apart, creating on the one hand dynamic beneficiary centers and, on the other hand, large declining areas. People move from the latter to the former. The state and the large enterprises become stronger, whereas the civil society becomes weaker. The prospect of total digital control of state and huge corporations over citizens becomes a reality in five or seven years, to my mind. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I was thinking of a couple of the thoughts of Thierry de Montbriol in relation to your portrayal of Russia in the digital age, including the question of cyber power at the state level. So within states, different actors can be empowered by cyber technology, armed services, tax revenue, um, not just actors internationally. Uh, interesting point. Um, a second point that you mentioned that um, we didn't quite deal with, but we may want to come back to, is whether Russia, with its successful digitalization, now faces concerns, growing concerns, about system vulnerability. I'm wondering in the energy sector, for instance, whether all of that is digitalized and interconnected and therefore vulnerable to attack. Um, and um, I think the um, question of digital inequality also lashes up, interestingly, with the first panel this morning about economic inequality. I think there, there must be not just a correlation, but causation there, but I'll leave it for others who have done the, the research on this issue to, to maybe speculate or to, to inform. Um, but that's an interesting question about the digital inequality 
uh, problem growing as well. As societies get more digitalized, digital inequality becomes a bigger problem. Anyway, let's move on to Professor Suzuki, who's also going to, I think, touch upon some of the big security issues from our digital age. Well, thank you, Patrick. Um, well, first of all, um, thank you very much for JIIA to invite me for this uh, very interesting and distinguished panel. And also, uh, congratulations for the 60th anniversary for the establishment of this institution. Um, and uh, I was expecting that there are there are a simultaneous translation. So, and most of the Japanese participants speak in uh, Japanese. Uh, so, I was uh, I was preparing my notes in Japanese. But nevertheless, uh, the uh, uh, Koyama-san, the MC, has has uh, said that this panel is in English. So, therefore, I have to speak in English. Um, <coughs> well, sorry if I uh, make any grammatical mistake or anything. Um, so, uh, uh, the, in terms of the digitalization of security, there are a couple points that I'd like to make. First, the, the concept of security or defense has changed dramatically because of the digitalization. Namely, the, uh, I, I think the traditional uh, security or defense system are based on the territorial defense. So uh, protecting the, a certain territory on the, on the geographical section on, on the earth has been the sort of a major for, uh, a patterns of, the, of, of implementing the security and tr uh, defense policy. The digitalization has just overcome and override all these uh, territorial issues. So if you want to protect your, your, your territory, Yes, you can do that by blocking the uh, 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 access from outside, but still there are lots of interactions, the global supply chain, the banking transactions between or uh, uh, crossing those, those uh, borders and territories. So how do you protect those territorial, uh, th those transactions, the values and assets that goes beyond your jurisdiction. The concept of jurisdiction on the digitalized economy and digitalized society is extremely different from what we traditionally think how we uh, implement our uh, security and, and uh, trade policy. And this is in particular true for the Japanese defense policy because the Japanese defense principle is basically a t territorial defense. Yes, of course, we do have the uh, uh, surveillance capabilities. We do send our uh, uh, self-defense forces mission to outside of the territory, but mostly the 95% of the, def the defense principle, defense programs are based on the territorial defense. So um, how do we conceptualize or reconceptualize, reconceptualize the uh, the concept of defense or security. That is the challenge that we are, we are also facing. And, and uh, uh, Mr. Monbrial and, and Pat also has mentioned about the vulnerability, you know, uh, the, the, the cross-border, uh, if you cannot uh, uh, protect your assets within your territory or with outside of, of your territory, those are both vulnerable to the um, uh, uh, attack via uh, internet, via uh, cyberspace, and it is the it is extremely difficult for those uh, those uh, actors, um, the multinational um, actors, uh, to protect its its assets, be it as a, um, a intellectual property or or physical assets. Uh, these are the, the the questions that we need to ask and. Also, most of those assets are, are, are held by the private entities. And how do you protect the uh, entities, private entities' assets outside of the territory as the part of the security policy? So we need to reconsider or re, uh, reshape the I, I, idea of, of the uh, uh, defense and security. The second uh, point I'd like to make is the the digitalization has changed the mode of the war fighting. The network-centric warfare is the sort of a buzzword in, uh, in last 10, 
10, 20 years. Um, the most of the equipments, the war fighting uh, equipments are, are basically networked and, and digitalized. If you fly F F-35 and y if you cut all the connections, if you attack on this, you know, the cyber network, then it's the, the F-35 is just a junk, a, a piece of piece of metal, and you you can't really have the capabilities. And this is also true, as Pat mentioned, that the the those uh, networking are going through the uh, via satellites. The space assets are now becoming critical for the operational aspects of the uh, of the war fighting. You can't really do anything without satellite by, for example, flying the drones or, or launching the cruise missile or, 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 or sailing, the, uh, sailing the ship. So, so basically, these are the, the consequence of the um, digitalization of the warfare. On the other side, the digitalization has changed the mode of the war, war fighting because there are lots of gray areas or let's say the hybrid, um, uh, hybrid warfare, that most of the uh, attacks do not happen immediately uh, with the physical, uh, physical kinetic attacks. Um, if you send your troops, it's the first thing that you need to do is try to kill the networks first, the cyber attack. Uh, you blind the... Uh, 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 the spy satellites. You try to uh, cut off the communications, and that is that is in a way to uh, uh, to to gain the advantages for the war fighting in the uh, in, in, on the field. And also, there is a war fighting in the cybersphere, um, as uh, Mr. Montreal, Montreal has mentioned that there is a cyber war between China and Taiwan, and it's not only that. There are uh, uh, cyber attacks everywhere. Perhaps Mr. Yokohama ha has known better than anybody. Um, that th there, there is the sort of constant attack because the cost of attack is much, much cheaper than the kinetic attack. And the, the, and the question of attribution is making it much easier because you cannot trace back to who uh, send all those commands and attacks from outside of your jurisdiction. So basically, this um, uh, uh, lack of the concept of jurisdiction and territoriality makes it very difficult for 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 establishing what is uh, how to make it safe for uh, for your lives, for your society, for your assets. And therefore, there is the question of the governance. The, the, the again, in traditional way, the um, if you want to uh, uh, if you want to control the substances for the chemical warfare or biological warfare, or if you want to control the technology for developing the nuclear uh, nuclear material, then you can do the export control, which means that the national authorities controls. The, those capable companies and capable universities and make sure that this technology doesn't go outside your jurisdiction so that you can, you can protect from the proliferation. But now it is much more difficult to protect those information going out of your uh, jurisdiction. And it is also very difficult for implementing those national rules and, and regulations to control the, na the entity inside your, your jurisdiction. So the governance issue, the digitalization weakening those controlling the uh, uh, technology of the, uh, uh, in your jurisdiction and often those uh, technology can go um, uh, uh, countries where much less governance is implemented, for example, the North Korea. North Korea is a very str has a very strong governance, but even though they don't have the technical capabilities, they can easily steal those technology from outside of their country, and also they can use those technology to, to acquire um, the values such as a cryptocurrency. 
and finally, the, uh, um, the problem of the, the security and digitalization is the lack of rules. Yes, there are um, cyber GGE, which is uh, taking place in this week. Uh, there, are there, there are efforts to establish the um, uh, um, uh, rules of the road, uh, but at the same time, it is, it is extremely difficult, not only because of the difference of the interest of the, uh, of the traditional diplomacy, the tr traditional state, uh, but it, it is also difficult because there is um, no consensus on the concept. For example, we are talking about the free, fair, and, and transparent. So the concept of free internet or free cyberspace is quite different from different country to, to another because uh, free means that you know no government intervention. If there is no government intervention, how can you make the, the governance there? So is it a, a, a governance of the private entities? So is it make it uh, is it possible to make a transparent private entity uh, networks? And is it possible for the private entity to contribute? to the national security. So these are the questions that is not being shared among the countries uh, participating in the rulemaking process. So these are the uh, uh, interesting subjects uh, with regard to, to um, digitalization and, and security, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Suzuki-san, thank you very much indeed. The, the, the image you raise at the very end of essentially the balkanization of the internet is a direct challenge to companies like NTT, which are assuming the globalization and this open technological revolution continuing in cyberspace in the digital age. So this is a perfect segue, I think, for Yoko Hamasan, who's bringing in a private sector dimension and also maybe emphasizing the fact that, with the exception of Chairman de Montbriol, who you know, studied as a mathematician originally, um, most of us are social scientists. And you, you know, the, the hard scientists are sometimes called the techies and we're called the fuzzies in the social science world. Um, and it's very difficult. It's a real challenge for diplomacy, for, this, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for the State Department, for other foreign ministries to become proficient in the digital age for, for partly that reason. So, Yokama-san, you will probably give us some advice on how, how we can collaborate with the private sector. And I am a total amateur in the national security or diplomacy, et cetera, et cetera. I feel very much disadvantaged, honestly speaking. Um, so actually, last evening, I asked for advice to Mr. Bell Elmont. How can I shine in this disadvantaged situation? And he gave me a very nice advice. And it was three, be short, <laughs> be crispy, and be prov pro provoca prov provocative, be provocative. Uh, so I try to be provocative and be short, by the way. Um, I, I try to bring some industry view. And I'm not sure, yeah, I mean, just one slide. <coughs> so this is the only slide I will share. Uh, this is our NTT's global internet backbone network. Since NTT is Japan-based company, it's obviously cuts across the Trans-Pacific, <laughs> as you see, and also connects Japan and the Asian countries with a undersea marine cables. But as you see, we also have a connectivity between the across Atlantic and across Siberia. Our network is truly global, not only Asia, very global. And in fact, we are the only company in the world which is global top five, both in network service and IT service. There is no other companies which are global top five, both in network and IT. That's what NTT is. So we see the world a little bit different. It's quite borderless, as you see. Um, one good example is, uh, as of July 1st this year, we integrated 28 different uh, auto Japanese companies into one company, which is now called NTT Limited. And this new NTT 
international NTT. Do you think where we chose uh, its headquarter? The answer is London. Despite of the Brexit, we intentionally <laughs> chose London because of this connectivity. As I understand, Heathrow is the airport which has the largest number of direct flights worldwide still. And it is easy to recruit high caliber IT talents in such cities. That's why we strategically chose London as its international headquarter. The other thing you can imagine from this diagram is that the internet infrastructure is owned and operated by private sectors. This is a part of the internet. Of course, the other service providers share the networks. I once analyzed how much IT assets does Japan have and how much are owned by the private sectors? The answer is 90%. 90% of the personal computers, servers, data centers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are owned and operated by corporations, not the governments. So implication is that I think that the there are lots of roles that the private sector should play and could play. And probably in a non-classical manner, different from the traditional national security discussions. As a part of our activities, a couple of examples. Last year, we formed a industry coalition called Council to Secure the Digital Economy. Uh, it's a coalition by 14 global ICT companies, and NTT is one of them, the founding members. The other companies are IBM, Akamai, Samsung, Vodafone, etc., etc. Et I can go on many other examples. But there is a move that the concerned international ICT players are getting together and to contribute to the formation of the global norms and also execution of those global norms. I'm not, I'm not saying that the private sector stand alone can solve all the things. There must be a lot of collaboration needed between the private sector and the governments. But it may be a little bit different approach from the classical national security discussion. And my closing remark is that NTT, strange name, officially stands for Nippon Telegraph and Telephone Company. It is a hundred year history. But I would say unofficially, NTT stands for New Tomorrow Together. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to just go back very quickly to each panelist, and then we'll have time, I think, for a couple of questions from the floor. Um, and Dr. DeMombriel, I wanted to push you more on um, the question of, uh, of cyber power and the fact that you mentioned that having an offensive cyber power was one critical component of being a cyber power. And I remember the uh, Canberra-based think tank, uh, Peter Jennings is here, ASPE has uh, a cataloged and tried to measure in the Asia-Pacific region uh, the growth of cyber power, starting with a baseline of a few years ago and then showing increased numbers of people, offensive capabilities, new investment. Um, if, if everybody wants to be a cyber power, and it's not just states, right? It's also big corporations as well, are cyber powers in effect. Um, what, is the, what is the natural governing force that eventually limits that and prevents it from spilling over into a hot war or into some escalatory uh, downturn in relations? Or is this, I mean, do, do how bad do things have to get before we start to figure out rules of the road? I, I think it is uh, difficult at this stage to answer uh, such a question. To my knowledge, there are not so many people uh, in, the, in the world who, who think uh, 
deeply on this uh, cyber power concept. But I, th I, I will restrict myself to, to one dimension, which is the concept of deterrence. Uh, well, deterrence is a clear concept in the nuclear strategy uh, world. And by the way, uh, I am one of those who believe that it has worked rem remarkably well. And uh, although this is not provable, uh, I think that if the Cold War ended uh, well, it is thanks to, 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 to that. And that's uh, why uh, when we speak about the full de denuclearization of the world, I think we have to, to think several times about uh, how unstable the world might be if, if, if the nuclear deterrence were to disappear too quickly. Uh, uh, that's my, my message to, to the Pope, uh, who uh, <laughs> I think recently uh, in, uh, in, in Japan, I, 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 have, I respect the Pope very much, the current Pope, but uh, I think uh, he, he has not uh, thought uh, enough on this issue. Now, on, on deterrence, on, 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 on the cyber thing, the concept of deterrence is, 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 uh, is, is, very, uh, is much more subtle. For instance, a few months ago, there was a huge electricity failure in New York City, you know, which started for three, uh, which, which lasted for three or four hours. Uh, I personally do not know exactly what is the end uh, of the story, but uh, one uh, possible interpretation, I'm sure that Paul Wolfovich here uh, knows the answer uh, better than, than I do. Do you know the, 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 uh, what happened exactly? No. I so think it was so dated so infrastructure. If you, if, you, if you do not know, I can give you my uh, possible interpretation. So a possible interpretation is that it was a message sent by a certain country uh, to show that they are able to do it. No. And uh, that uh, you know, four hours, you create a problem, a significant problem, but not enough. It's not a catastrophe. But uh, I in this case, we mentioned, uh, several of us mentioned the attribution problem. In, in such a case, uh, if the attack cannot be attributed easily, you have to uh, send a message uh, that it a little bit like the, 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 the terrorists, for instance, uh, uh, as, as you know, I think it was last week, uh, we had two uh, French helicopters who collided in Mali with uh, about 10 uh, ca casualties and, uh, and uh, ISIS uh, people after the uh, accident uh, claimed you know, they, they organized uh, this, they were responsible for this uh, for this incident. Uh, actually, uh, nobody knows, and, and, and in this case, um, maybe the real story has nothing to do with them, but they, 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 uh, they sent a message you know, to, so it, you have similar things uh, in this uh, cyber uh, warfare uh, system. So what I am trying to say is that the rules of the game are uh, changing uh, 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 totally, because if, you know, all the potential cyber powers at a certain moment target uh, some specific uh, well, adversaries, let's say, and just show them what they can do. And uh, perhaps even, you know, let uh, them believe that their capacities are perhaps even stronger than what they are in reality. You can imagine the uh, a, a sort of stabilization through uh, the diversity of, uh, 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 of actions which are not real uh, attacks uh, but signals which are a, 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 a new kind of, of, of deterrence. So I give you that just uh, as, as an example because I believe that it is too early uh, to uh, even to think uh, ab about a security uh, si uh, system that could be uh, that could be uh, relevant for these uh, for, for for these new uh, uh, things. I think uh, 
Mr. Suzuki Kazuto made an excellent presentation, and I said some of the security issues, but it seems to me that most of the security issues you, you mentioned, today nobody has totally clear-minded about how to face them. For instance, when you very, very rightly reminded us that uh, talking about uh, cyber security in a large sense, that immediately means uh, space uh, security, it is, it is something which is very troubling because I in, in fact, you know, uh, in the last uh, two or three decades, there was this postulate that we should never carry the war uh, in, in the space. And, 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 and now you have, I don't know many, maybe 10,000 new satellites, maybe more, I don't know, that's the order of magnitude in, in, in the space, in the outer. So uh, we, we have to, to rethink all this matter uh, anew, you know, uh, and, and that's a formidable task. It is indeed. Um, and you're right about attacks. I'm thinking North Korea's attack on Sony years ago, you know, projected a cyber power from North Korea that seemed bigger than life. There was an attack in September on an Indian nuclear power plant. Now, whether that attack was not successful, unlike the attack that maybe that were an attack in New York, um, but it did send a different signal that maybe critical infrastructure could be vulnerable. Um, and, and to sorry to and, and companies. Uh, some of you know the, the French company Saint Gobain. Saint Gobain, which is a very major company, a few months ago, they were uh, attacked, and for a few days, actually. Even the personal assistant of the, of the chairman and CEO uh, could not make calls. She, she had to use her, her, her personal smartphone <laughs> to, to, to be connected outside. And uh, in, in this case, uh, my interpretation is that the origin was clearly identified and it was uh, from a large country which is not far from here. So, Dr. Fedorov, I want to ask you a tough question, but I think a fair question. I'll, it'll be a theoretical question. So I'm not putting you on the spot about what Russia does or does not do. But Russia, Russia has growing cyber capability. So, and you, you are close to public opinion in Russia. You poll all Russian public opinion. Nobody knows public opinion in Russia better than you, I think. Um, do you think the Russian attitude toward the offensive, potential offensive use of cyber outside of your borders is, is you know, all's fair in love and cyber war? Or are there, are there rules that you think Russia is seeking to, to establish internationally? I mean, so how, does, how, does, how do Russians think about the use of cyber outside of their borders? Everybody does it, you know, uh, or, and therefore Russia must do it? Or no, we should be cautious about it. Or what are the different views, maybe? Different views. <laughs> uh, but our priority is not offensive, but <laughs> defensive. Uh, uh, and uh, this question is not uh, very widely discussed in Russian society. Uh, for us, uh, another questions are more actual. Uh, for example, state agencies and uh, state affiliated companies, just like the private ones, uh, are accumulating huge user databases bases, uh, and can use it uh, and can use them uh, in their own interests. And we know it from the experience of our uh, Western and Eastern partners. Uh, on this, Russia is uh, moving in parallel with uh, the Western uh, and Eastern world, and we have a rather strict law on personal data, but uh, the exper experience of its practical application is rather weak so far. Uh, and uh, the vulnerability of the digitalized spheres is growing in Russia too. Uh, and here, us, uh, and, uh, here our so-called advantage uh, of being backward is gradually running out. Uh, the government and companies are spending more on cyber, cyber protection. But this year in Russia, 
uh, there have been several cases of large-scale theft of client database, databases. All of that uh, leads to more concern in society and makes ensuring privacy a top priority. Uh, the concern that, uh, that are not about the state as such, but about the abuse of uh, its capabilities by corrupt officials and low-income civil servants. Thank you very much. Suzuki-san, I wonder if we could follow up on the cyber deterrence question. And I want to ask a very specific question because the U.S.-Japan alliance has recently upgraded the concern about cybersecurity as well as electromagnetic spectrum in space, the new domain, so-called, um, and has added uh, in recent uh, proclamations by both governments an Article 5 guarantee on the potential guarantee in some situations. It's vague. But, but in your thinking, is that kind of guarantee about deterring cyber attacks or is it about deterring the escalation from cyber to conventional, or is it about something yet altogether different? Right. Um, that's a very good and tough question. Um, well, first of all, um, the attribution question remains. The, even though you have this Article 5 and, and, and capable de deterrence power and using the cross-domain deterrence, for example, if you have the cyber attack, then you can attack back with a physical uh, kinetic attack. For example, what happened in the, between uh, Hamas and, uh, and Israel. The Israel has launched a missile to uh, precisely targeting the operational, cyber operational center of Hamas uh, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and that was the first case, I believe, that the, the, the kinetic force was used against the cyber attack. So if it it is uh, it is true that we can we can find the uh, source of the attack. We can launch the um, uh, uh, we can launch the uh, 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 the the kinetic um, retaliation uh, forces to and and that makes the um, certain def deterrence capability. The problem also, but still. The problem remains as the attribution. Um, so, I, I think the case in the Mal the helicopter shooting down the helicopter in Mali is is one thing that you it was a case of lack of awareness or domain awareness. And I think the the first thing that we need to do is to increase the domain awareness in the cyberspace to make sure that we improved our technology to figure out where the, the attacks come from. Uh, but still, you know, it is a sort of a cat and mouse game that, you know, the more you have <laughs> this uh, domain awareness capability, then, you, you know, the attacker might have a different way to persuade or, you know, the avoid those uh, networks or the, those radars. So, uh, again, I, I think this is a political declaration of, of stating that the Article 5 can be uh, applicable for the cyber attack, but it is it, it is still difficult to control the escalation as long as you don't know who is it, who is doing the attack. And Yokohama-san, finally, how do we hold technological corporations accountable? I mean, what is your response to the concern, not to, toward NTT, but toward American corporations, international corporations that are gathering more and more uh, power um, and capability, and yet don't have the transparency. How do we hold them accountable as they gather more data? They're, they're collecting big data. They have the technical means. And we heard on the earlier keynote remarks from Bill Emmett, he talked about the 2008 financial crisis, and he attributed it to essentially banks being under-regulated. So without rushing to regulate innovation, <laughs> What is the balancing act? How do, from a corporate perspective and from a private sector perspective, how do we balance innovation that we want from the private sector with the need for transparency and responsibility? Thank you. Um, si since Jerry mentioned the rule of the game, 
I just want to share some numbers about what is the current status of the rule of the game of cyber war, cyber crimes. Globally, the worldwide GDP, as I understand, somewhere around 80 trillion US dollars. And how much the human beings spent on ICT, it's roughly 2% of that. That's 1.6 trillion US dollars. How much do we spend on security? It's somewhere around 100 billion dollars. That's a six or seven percent of the ICT spent. So we are spending 100 billion dollars every year for cybersecurity. Next question is how much are we losing? And there's no formal statistics. I think it was three years ago, the Center of Strategy and I International Studies, CSIS, made a report. It's somewhere around $600 billion. Most recently, other reports say it's $1 trillion, maybe $2 trillion. So we are spending $100 billion, but we are losing $1 trillion. And clearly, the system is not functioning. Because if I'm smart enough, I'm a hacker, then where should I go? The addressable market for a good person is $100 billion, whereas a bad guy has a market opportunity 10 times larger than the good market. The human beings are now incentivizing people to do bad things. That's the current status. And we have to change the rule. That's what I mean by changing the rule of the game. And that goes back to Patrick, your question about what are innovations? And I think that game changing innovation is needed, definitely, clearly. And from my point of view, such game changing innovation is possible only by combination of physical technology, such as network technology, encryptions, or computer technologies, but also social technologies, which is more law enforcement, international orders, even the ethical educations. It's a combination of both physical technology and ethical technologies are needed. And I'm not uh, saying that the we as our ICT companies should confine ourselves only to the physical technologies. We should also expand our reach to the social technologies. And in fact, NTT recently announced a new concept beyond 5G, 6G. What should we do? It's I-O-N, I-O-W-N, Innovative Optical Wireless Network Concept. We are calling for global partners to participate. And it's a combination, not only the physical technologies, and, but also the social technologies. Thank you. Do we have time for a question or two? Yes. Yes, sir. Your hand was up right away. And I don't know if there's a microphone coming toward you. I think there will be. And th this woman over here is. So those two questions we'll have time for. Hello. Uh, I am Banyan Shamin, scientific attache of the Iran Embassy. Uh, writer of book of the cyber diplomacy, teaching cyber diplomacy in different universities. Mm. Uh, my comment is that you can add uh, one crime to the list of the crime of the uh, for the cyber, the uh, uh, crime of the government cyber. Uh, means that pushing the uh, uh, people of a country to be more deeply in the cyber. That means that uh, when you are uh, a society more digital, the human relation will be less. Uh, when I'm traveling in the metro in Tokyo and the bus, everybody is looking. Yeah. I don't afraid to ask any question because everybody is, I don't want to disturb them. And uh, we uh, discussed with the professor of the university in society, uh, psychology, uh, we are talking about that because uh, when you are G5, G7, G10, G infinity, then the relation of the humanity will be less. And uh, the conclusion, be, if I am wrong, you say. 
20,000 suicides in the Japan. It's always, I was thinking, a very beautiful country with a huge, uh, very long history. Why 20,000 suicides must be there? One of the reasons I think that uh, 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 human relation is decreasing and digital uh, society is growing. I think this is the duty of the government that uh, as a, a father of the family uh, control the, this balance. Uh, in these days in the, in the home, father there in one a smartphone, mother, children, no talking in the uh, home. Everybody is busy with their network and okay. it is the uh, danger of the, uh, I think. Uh, we, we've got the point, it's, it's an excellent point. I think it's a very serious point. I was actually thinking at the human level how this technology is changing everything from the brain to how we interact. It was Victor Hugo who said that if you're a single soul, you cease to be human because we're supposed to be social. But what if we're connected with everybody? <laughs> what if we're too connected? Um, that emotion that you were talking about, and maybe I want to get a response here from at least Dr. Lamarell, but let's take this lady's question here first. Thank you so very much. Um, so all speakers, thank I, really, I really appreciate your profound um, talk. My name is Yoko Nita, working in cybersecurity for years, um, as an advisor to the government institutes. So um, first of all, I'd love to um, congratulate on um, Mr. Yokohama maybe from NTT because you mentioned, you touched upon the uh, marine cables. <laughs> nobody, no, I mean, nobody else, I mean, you know, mentioned regarding the marine cables because we have to pay attention to that. Over 90% of our telecommunications go through marine cables. So thank you for touching upon it. So um, I have two questions, very quick. So first of all, I'd like to ask uh, my Russian colleague um, regarding sort of um, relationship, I mean, you know, between your RUNET, I mean, internet shutdown, you know, lately. And also the reality is, um, of course, there should be no digital divide in Russia, of course, and in, in other countries as well. But the reality is um, Putin has decided to um, accelerate, you know, Russian economy ut ut um, utilizing the uh, digitalized economy. So it passed, you know, the path of law. So it's, 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 it's already the law. So, so, what, so what is the question okay, about so, Russia? So, 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 digitalized so you're pushing the digitalized economy. And also you decided to shut down the internet. So okay, how okay. does it work? Right. So uh, the, that, that's my question. And my right. second question is. Did you okay. understand that, Dr. Federer? So the, how do you reconcile? Right. Okay, very good. His okay. English is not his best language, so just. Right. Um, and my other yeah. question is, the other question is to um, my French colleague. Um, so haven't we arrived at a point um, that we have to talk, we have to think about the security um, in, a, in a, you know, the, the foundation of the digitalized in domain? Um, we haven't. Um, you know, talk about maybe the rule of law, you know, for this digitalized economy, I mean, this world, domain. So probably we need to regulate, um, I don't know, regulation of AI, regulation of um, 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 business model, you know, regulation of um, content, you know, forever. So um, I'd like to invite your thought. Thank you. Well, very good. So. Any final comments in response to these questions? Very briefly, we can just start down with your comments. If you wanted to say anything in response to, to that. No, thank you. I'll be shut down. Okay, very good. Suzuki-san. Um, just to, to mention about the um, how to uh, establish the rule of law, uh, the, the, uh, the regulations. Um, I think one of the important thing, it, it, it is in the this slogan of the of this um, conference, the transparency. The, um, even the uh, GGE, cyber GGE at the United Nations are talking about the, the, you know, the increasing uh, importance of the transparency and how you understand the, what is going on in, in the cyber domain. That, that, and I, I think this relates to the question of the, uh, the, the, the domain awareness. If you don't share the information, if you don't act transparently, then it's easy to go into the sort of a darker side of the, of the digital activities. So how to bring up the uh, transparency at the national level 
is one of the key questions that we need to work on. And I think those capable com countries need to work and demonstrate as a role model to, uh, to, to show that these are the way in which that you can, you can increase the transparency while you are not undermining the, the secrecies or the, uh, or the intellectual properties or et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think th th that's sort of a formula that we need to, to figure out and that's the task for the future. Dr. Fedorov, please Thank you for your question. Uh, this is a Russian way for modernization. Like uh, uh, three centuries ago, uh, in the times of uh, Peter the Great, uh, uh, we want to uh, take uh, technologies, but not ideologies. Hmm. Uh, we need economic boost uh, as we, we face sanctions. Uh, and uh, we see it as digitalization as a way for economic boost. And we wanted not to serve Russia, not vice versa. Dr. DeMombrio, you're going to get the final substantive word on this panel. <laughs> I wouldn't pretend to do that, but I would like to make two, uh, uh, two uh, remarks in reaction to uh, s some part of the debate. Well, first, I think that cybersecurity is not all about uh, virtuality or about uh, non-territoriality. I am thinking of uh, the data centers, for instance. So today we see data centers are physical assets which are now bigger and bigger. Look, for instance, at the Amazon uh, huge uh, deployments of data centers. Well, these uh, assets uh, uh, are vulnerable in the most classical sense. You know, if, if, I were to, if, if, if I wanted to, uh, to, 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 to hurt uh, the United States or whoever, uh, uh, clearly these data centers would be a very good uh, traditional, uh, uh, tr traditional um, uh, targets. Yeah. So, so that's uh, so one point. So uh, submarine cables. Yes, of course. Yeah. There, there are many, many other uh, examples of these things. Which means that, strategically speaking, uh, again, you know, there might be a case for uh, to study the dispersion of assets to have a smaller rather than larger uh, data centers, typically, and so forth and so on. That's one uh, issue. My, uh, my second and last remark is uh, one on, on, on one uh, point from uh, Shinichi Yokohama. He said very rightly that if we want to think on about, uh, to think more on, on cybersecurity, we have to combine, you said, well, or physical uh, technologies, but uh, also well, human training, so to speak, including the ethical aspects. And uh, that's very true, and it reminds me of some recent declaration of the French president, for instance, about terrorism, fighting terrorism. If we want to fight terrorism anywhere, it, we, 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 it is the whole society which, ha which has to, 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 to adapt. Uh, uh, but then, you know, all these take a, a long of, uh, very long time. It, we cannot expect these things to be uh, achieved uh, overnight. And if you allow me, I would like to ask one question, very precise question, to our Japanese uh, friends here who are very knowledgeable. Uh, that's on the question of attribution. No, from a theoretical viewpoint, is there an impossibility or not uh, to solve that problem of attribution. In other terms, is it a solvable problem that we have not yet <coughs> found a good ways to do it? Or is it, for some deeper reasons, an unsolvable problem? I want to be both uh, realistic and idealistic. So idealistically, it is solvable. If we track the packet flow from one carrier to another, to another, to another, to another, we eventually reach out to the originations. Uh, practically, uh, realistically, it is impossible. Th that's a real reality. 
We're going to have for, to for, forever. <laughs> we're going to have to leave this as an imponderable question for the future. <laughs> this is a global dialogue. We're trying to raise questions, and this is just the beginning. But would you please join me in thanking this distinguished panel? Thank you very much. Arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you. I'd like to take a lunch break.